The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Paul Fenton. I'm the uh, president and CEO of Montreal. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about how we can validate SharePoint for regulated life science yeah. applications. Does it sound okay? Yeah. yeah. Um. I apologize for the background noise there. So the objective of our webinar today is really um, very practical. We're going to be looking at how we can um, approach the validation of a platform such as SharePoint um, that can be used obviously for many, many different um, applications uh, within the life sciences. We will be uh, distributing the slides as well. Um, if you can uh, just contact us uh, via email, we'll send you through the slides. They'll also be available on our website. Um, you can also ask questions during the uh, webinar, and if we have some time at the end, we'll address some of those questions directly on the webinar. And some of my colleagues are online um, to answer those questions as well. Um, after the webinar, if you have any other questions, you can tweet me as well. Um, so uh, I'm at Paul K. Fenton. And finally, thank you for, for joining today. So an overview of the, the webinar. Um, the first thing that we're going to do is really look at the objectives of, of validation. So why do we need to validate? Um, we'll look at the regulatory requirements. So we'll look at the primary regulations and, and what they say. Um, we'll then move into... Um, electronic records and how we can identify electronic records because that's really um, a core concept when it comes to SharePoint. We'll talk about how we can use SharePoint within GXP environments and then the main part of the, the webinar really is looking at the documentation model and how um, do we produce uh, the necessary documented evidence to show that SharePoint is qualified for its intended use. We'll touch on how we can also uh, implement effective configuration and change control because once we've got a validated environment we of course need to have configuration and change control in place and then we'll finish up by looking at how we can maximize quality and return on investment and talk a little bit about some lessons learned um, from our experience and best practices. So what is computer systems validation? Computer systems validation is, is primarily a formal process that enables us to ensure that our systems consistently operate as they were intended. It's also a process which allows us to clearly demonstrate that user business and regulatory system requirements have been met and that our information is secure and properly managed within the system. So we're really thinking very uh, carefully about data integrity and data security. Finally, it's also a process which allows us to ensure that we have the proper procedural controls and, and the proper SOPs in place so that we can actually use and manage the system. Now, if we think about the regulations, there are some key regulations, and, and I don't have all of them, but there, is, there are obviously um, the, the, the main regulations that we typically use to be able to um, identify what we need to do um, in terms of validation and change control. The first one, 21 CFR Part 11, I'm pretty sure everybody on the call today has heard of. Um, and 21 CFR Part 11, 1110A basically tells us that um, it's a requirement to ensure the validation of systems, to ensure accuracy, reliability, consist consistent intended performance and the ability to discern invalid or altered records and that's really all it tells us and so it's fairly vague um, and that's why we need to uh, be able to, to implement a, a standard or a framework um, which is generally accepted in industry to validate and to meet that requirement. The other um, piece of uh, legislation or, or regulation is uh, ICHE 6 GCP which of course is integrated uh, into the, uh, the local uh, directives and, and legislation and Section 553A, um, which is really sort of looking at things primarily from a data management standpoint, says that we have to ensure and document that the electronic data processing systems conforms to the sponsor's established requirements for completeness, accuracy, reliability, and consistent intended performance, i.e. validation. So fairly similar to what 21 CFR Part 11 is saying. On the European side, we obviously have Annex 11, um, which is considered almost the equivalent to 21 CFR Part 11, 
Um, it is really sort of geared more towards GMP environments, but is used within GCP, GLP, and medical device environments as well. Um, and Section 4 um, talks about validation. Annex 11 typically gives us more, more information or is more explicit um, than 21 CFR Part 11. So 4.1 um, talks about um, validation, documentation, and reports that should cover relevant steps of the life cycle. Manufacturers should be able to justify their standards, protocols, acceptance criteria, procedures, and records based on their risk assessment. So for the first time, we're seeing um, the expectation that we're using risk assessment and a risk-based approach. Uh, 4.2 also talks about um, the fact that we have to have change control records uh, and reports on any deviations observed during the validation process. Now, there are other um, uh, points as well within Section 4 um, that you can look at, which gives us more, more sort of guidance in terms of validation as well. Another piece of guidance is um, from FDA, computer systems used in clinical uh, investigations. Um, and here, um, they're primarily talking about the fact that we have to ensure the integrity of data, um, and uh, to do this, we need to have change control. Two other documents which uh, I recommend that you look at is um, PICS, um, so the Pharmaceutical Inspectorate Collaboration Scheme, um, and PICS 11.3, Good Practices for Computerized Systems in Regulated GXP Environments, gives us a lot of insight into what the inspectors expect to see. Um, so it's about a 50-page document or so, and it really does give you a lot of information um, that we can use to, to base our approach on. The other document, uh, slightly older, comes from, uh, from FDA, General Principles of Software Validation, Final Guidance for Industry and FDA Staff. This, again, is, a, is a very much a GMP-type document, um, but it does give you some, some insight into um, what FDA inspectors are, are really looking for. Uh, notably, it talks a lot about evidence, uh, documented evidence. So to sum up what is, what's expected from the regulators, the first thing is that procedures should be in place to make sure that um, the systems that we're using for regulated ac activities are adequ adequately va uh, validated, that the systems should be maintained in a validated state, and to do that we have to use change control mechanisms, that sponsors take a risk-based approach to uh, computer systems validation, and this is becoming very much mainstream nowadays, um, and that the individuals involved in computer systems validation activities and the maintenance of the systems themselves have adequate experience and training. So those are the, the four key points that, that the, uh, the regulators expect to see. So let's talk a little bit about electronic records, because obviously if we're validating a system, we're validating it to ensure that we're able to properly um, generate and maintain records upon which we're making regulated decisions or that we're submitting to the regulatory agencies or that we're required to maintain per predicate rule. 21 CFR Part 11, Scope and Application 2003, gives us uh, clear guidance in terms of what um, is considered to be an electronic record per the rule. Uh, and there are four different types. Uh, the first is uh, any record that's required to be maintained un under predicate rule and that are maintained in electronic format in place of paper format. So really we're talking about any electronic source that's required by predicate rule. The second type of record is anything that's required to be maintained under predicate rule that are maintained in electronic format in addition to paper format and that are relied on to perform regulated activities. So this is really electronic copies of paper records. Um, so you know, quite often we'll scan electronic documents or, or, uh, or records and we'll, we'll keep those documents centrally and we'll potentially make decisions on the electronic copy. And so we, because we're making those decisions, we have to maintain it as a record. The third type is anything that's submitted to FDA uh, under predicate rules. So, so this is typically all of our electronic submissions. Um, and then finally, electronic signatures um, that are intended to be the equivalent of handwritten signatures, uh, initials or other general signings required by predicate rules. And so, so electronic signatures also have to be maintained as records. So if we think about all of that within the context of SharePoint, um, records within SharePoint could, of course, be documents. Um, and when we store documents in, in SharePoint, we also typically associate metadata to those documents. Um, 
within this initial context, the documents is, itself would be the record and not necessarily the descriptive uh, metadata. And only documents required by predicate rule would be considered records within this context. The second um, type of record could actually be metadata itself if we're using that metadata to make regulated decisions. So sometimes we may store metadata to be able to track uh, activities or status of, of different uh, processes. Um, and if uh, that data has a, regula a regulatory impact, then we would consider it a record. Finally, uh, InfoPath forms could also be considered um, a, a record if it's uh, being used to document rec regulated activities. Electronic and digital signatures, if, if you're using them within the context of SharePoint, um, obviously SharePoint doesn't have native uh, electronic and digital signature capability at the moment. Um, and so typically we use third-party solutions. Um, but if we're using them uh, integrated into SharePoint, then of course we need to maintain them as records. And then finally, all of the audit trails, so SharePoint does have audit trail capability, um, and typically we need to apply audit trails to, to the records that we're generating, then any of those audit trails that are generated would also need to be maintained as records. So in sum, um, to, to really be able to answer the question, you know, am I, am I generating or managing electronic records within SharePoint, we need to um, consider certain points. So the first is, does the record exist in electronic format only with no paper source? Is an electronic copy of the paper record being used to drive regulated processes? Is the record required by predicate rule? And does the record drive a regulated process or decision? And if, if the answer to any of those questions is yes, then basically 21 CFR Part 11 would apply, and we would need to validate the system to comply with 21 CFR Part 11. Um, typically, we need to validate this, uh, this decision within our, uh, our uh, validation assessment document or our validation plan. Um, within that same document, we would also indicate the scope of validation, and that's very important because obviously we're going to use that to govern all of the subsequent validation activities. So let's talk a little bit about how we can use um, SharePoint within uh, a GXP context. So for those of you who don't know SharePoint, SharePoint is a, a web portal technology um, that's extremely customizable, very user friendly and can be used for many, many different things. Um, within a GXP context, we could imagine using SharePoint to, of course, manage documents and GXP records. SharePoint has um, native uh, EDMS um, and records management capabilities. Um, we can also design electronic forms to be able to collect data uh, for the various different uh, operational activities that we're running. We can manage lists and trackers of information. So in, in, in the past and still today, um, a lot of groups use Excel to be able to track information, um, especially within sort of clinical operations. Um, this can be quite problematic uh, because of versioning issues and, and confidentiality and things like that. Um, we can actually use SharePoint to replace those Excel um, trackers or, or access databases because we have um, list uh, type uh, capabilities within the platform. We can also manage the distribution of information uh, and we can uh, improve collaboration between um, various different teams that may be working globally. Um, within a, a GXP context. And we can also uh, implement interactive workflows. And this is very important because it allows us to drive processes um, and also uh, improve control uh, and uh, compliance with our SOPs. And then finally, um, there's, there's also a big uh, business intelligence uh, element to SharePoint. And we can build out a whole series of different uh, metrics and KPIs and dashboards um, for our GXP operations. Um, these can often be based also on all of the data that we're generating with workflows, and this um, can uh, significantly uh, facilitate decision making within the context of our, our GXP operation. Now all of that sounds great, but of course there are, there are challenges. Um, I think the first challenge is really that SharePoint is a technology that's, that's really being adopted massively by the life science industry and I think the vast majority of companies now um, have either implemented SharePoint or plan to implement it. Quite a few of them 
have implemented it for non-regulated activities and are, and are now considering moving uh, into the regulated space and deploying regulated applications. Um, the problem really is, is that SharePoint can be a victim of its own success and quite often can grow very organically um, and it can get out of hand very quickly and so it's very difficult um, to manage it. Uh, within the context of a regulated environment, it's of course imperative to, to have proper configuration control um, so that we can manage the validated state of, of SharePoint. And, and so that's really where one of our, our big challenges is. Um, the reason why it's a challenge is because also there's a lot of granularity uh, within uh, a configuration that we would deploy within SharePoint. And we'll have a look at this a little bit later on um, in terms of how we can potentially manage um, that granularity. And then finally, um, it's very, very important that organizations plan uh, their SharePoint uh, architecture uh, and configuration uh, to, to make sure that it's uh, scalable and also to ensure that we can remain within compliance. Um, it's very important to, to really sort of uh, put in place a, a governance plan and a governance committee um, to ensure that we have proper rules uh, to maintain the environment. So let's now talk a little bit about uh, how we go about um, validating SharePoint or qualifying SharePoint um, and the type of documentation that we need to produce. Now within, uh, within the context of SharePoint there are different layers um, of, uh, of uh, documentation um, and it really is sort of a building block approach. When, when we start up um, at the bottom here um, we're really um, looking at all of the, uh, the hardware and the prerequisite software. So the operating system, the database system, because obviously SharePoint is running on SQL Server. Um, and here we need to, uh, to perform what we call hardware verification and installation verification. So we'll have documentation for the underlying uh, hardware and software. Um, it could also be cloud-based and, and we would have, of course, the corresponding documentation to show that we properly uh, qualified um, our cloud image upon which we are deploying SharePoint. The next uh, layer is really the, 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 the SharePoint application itself. And so here at Montreal, when we qualify SharePoint, uh, we typically qualify SharePoint against 21 CFR Part 11 electronic records. Um, the reason why we do this is because afterwards we're going to deploy applications on top of SharePoint, and it's within the context of the specific applications that we would actually validate any other functionality that was being used. So really we're just focusing on electronic records to, 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 to build a, a validated foundation. And the documentation that we're producing is really all of the specification documents um, which map to 21 CFR Part 11 as well as any, any validation documents that we need to be able to properly verify that SharePoint has been installed and configured to be able to meet the requirements of 21 CFR Part 11. Once we've got that in place, we have a qualified platform upon which we can then deploy other applications or solutions. So typically these are in three different groups. We have third-party applications, and so there are many, many different applications now that will integrate with, with SharePoint. I've mentioned a few here, so Nintex, AdLib, Cosign. There are many others. Um, and basically, depending on the type of application, we would define the, the documentation set that would be required to uh, clearly uh, demonstrate that that application was installed properly and that it's working properly or it's operating correctly uh, within the, uh, the qualified SharePoint environment. The documentation would also be defined typically in your SOPs on computer system validation. The second group of applications is really any custom SharePoint applications or solutions. Um, so anything you're actually building um, yourselves or that you're mandating a, a company to build. And here, um, typically there's going to be code involved and so we need to have um, a specification document, so this is user and, and functional specifications. We need to have design documentation, so design specifications. Typically we would then have a series of different validations. Uh, there would be technical validations or testing and then there would be the, uh, the end user um, testing. Uh, we would also need to have, of course, SOPs in place to be able to govern the use and the maintenance of that application or solution. The last um, area is really uh, standard SharePoint configurations. So there's a lot of different areas within SharePoint where we need to, to configure the system. So at the, at the system level, um, the central admin level, the user level, and the application level. 
to be able to properly document this, we, we will have a, a configuration specification. Um, and this configuration specification should be a con controlled document. And it will contain all of the, the different parameters that we need to use to be able to properly configure the system at all of the different levels. Um, and then we'll also have an SOP or SOPs to be able to govern that configuration process. So you can see from this diagram, really, we need to build up the documentation and create a framework which we, we can then use to uh, continuously add uh, new uh, solutions or applications uh, or configuration to the SharePoint environment. So let's talk a little bit about risk um, uh, and using a risk-based approach within the, the, within the context of a, a, of a validation um, project and, and notably within the context of SharePoint. So as we saw um, in Europe uh, and the Annex 11 um, regulation, the agencies are, are actively encouraging the use of a risk-based approach uh, for, for the validation of computerized systems. The reason why um, they're doing this is because typically in the past we've we've tend to do we've tend to done 100% uh, validation, which could be a very own, you know, long and and uh, complex process, which would generate a lot of documentation, but wouldn't necessarily generate high quality because we would drown in in, in all of the details. And so by using a risk-based approach, we're able really to to focus on the high risk areas uh, of uh, the system that we're we're validating whilst also reducing the validation effort and, and ultimately improving quality because we're much more focused. When we um, start the deployment of SharePoint for regulated environments, it's very important for us to evaluate the risk so that we can focus our efforts on the high-risk areas. And typically, the risk would be measured at two, level, two levels. First of all, we would do a general procedural risk. So we, we would ask ourselves, OK, so what are we using this application for? What are the processes that we're governing? with this application um, and are those processes regulated or not. Um, and from there we can then identify the different functions that are being used within the context of those processes um, and we would then perform a more detailed functional risk assessment um, on the functions that we've identified. Risk um, is not only regulatory, it can also be business risk, so your, your ability to, to run your business is, is important, um, and so we also need to take that into account. When we're using a risk-based approach, we need to clearly specify this um, within, uh, within our validation plan uh, and explain the rationale as to why we, we feel that a risk-based approach um, is appropriate and how we're going to use the risk assessment to be able to focus our validation activities. It's very, very important when we do uh, risk assessment um, exercises that, that a knowledgeable team is involved in, in actually performing that exercise. And this team really should be composed of um, you know, technical as well as um, operational uh, and, and quality and regulatory um, type individuals so that we can look at it from all of the different uh, angles. One thing that's very important as well is to, is to have a good moderator. It's very important to be, to be strict because obviously with, with enough debate, everything becomes high risk. And so we have to be very pragmatic uh, when, we, uh, when we perform a risk uh, assessment. Um, and we need to, of course, properly document that as well. Now let's, um, let's now sort of start to get into um, the, 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 the validation model. So within our industry, we do have um, a standard uh, or a framework rather, um, which comes from ISPE, uh, which is called GAMP. Uh, and currently we're at version uh, 5 of GAMP. Uh, version 6 uh, is on the horizon, and there are some interesting changes there in terms of cloud computing. The GAMP framework really provides us with a standard framework for achieving compliant GXP computerized systems. The GAMP framework is also widely recognized and understood by the industry. Um, and even by the inspectorates, because GAMP is quoted within the PICS uh, guidance. GAMP provides us uh, with various different categories of, of systems and allows us to, to uh, clearly define what level of documentation um, is required for the different types of systems. Now, when we think about SharePoint, SharePoint really is considered to be a configured off-the-shelf system within the context of GAMP, and so there's a certain amount of documentation that we need to produce um, which is actually less than, than say, a custom-developed uh, system. The reason why there's less documentation is because it's expected that the, the 
configured off-the-shelf systems have already undergone a significant amount of validation during the development by the vendor. So, of course, the vendor of SharePoint is Microsoft, and Microsoft has already gone through a significant amount of testing uh, to be able to produce the final product which has been released onto the market. Um, so in general, configured off-the-shelf systems really require less validation effort, but they still require validation. Now I'm sure that a lot of you have seen this type of diagram before. It's what we call a, uh, the V diagram. Um, and this is the V diagram for um, a configured uh, product, and this is coming from, uh, from GAMP. So on the left-hand side, we have all of our specifications. So for a configured product, we still need a user requirement specification because we need to know how we're going to be using that product. Typically, we'll have a functional specification as well, which will descri describe how the system is functioning in relation to those user requirements. And then we'll have a configuration specification. So there's no design documents here because there's no real coding going on. We're really only just doing configuration. Once we've um, completed all of our specifications and they've all been approved, we would then go ahead and configure uh, the product. Once we've uh, configured our product, we then go into configuration testing. So this is really IQ and then functional testing OQ. Um, in GAMP5, we also now call it installation verification and, and uh, operational verification. Once we've done our functional testing, um, we would then typically go into requirements testing or PQ. Once we've done our requirements testing, um, the system is usually released into production and we then move into a change control situation where we're producing change controls uh, to be able to make changes to that validated system whilst maintaining the validated state. And so to do this, we typically perform impact assessments um, and then we go into our configuration management process where we would update our configuration specification. We would then approve that, reconfigure the product and then go through um, some level of testing again um, so that we can get back into a validated state. So that's really the process that we're dealing with for something like SharePoint. So I'm going to go through some examples now of the different documents that we produce um, as part of uh, the, uh, the validation effort. Um, these examples come from a, a validation pack that we've developed here at Montreum uh, for companies that want to be able to validate um, their SharePoint 2013 uh, environment for regulated applications. So the first document that we actually produce is the validation assessment. Um, and the validation uh, assessment really um, aims to define the intended use of the system. That's very important. And so what we do in the validation assessment is we first of all identify what system category according to GAMP uh, we consider SharePoint to be. And so we indicate that, that SharePoint 2013 is considered to be a Category 4 um, system uh, as defined in GAMP 5 and Category 4 is configured off the shelf. We then talk about the intended use. Now obviously we're trying to validate the baseline SharePoint environment for, uh, to allow it to be used for regulated applications and, and for, to allow us to deploy applications on top of this environment. And so we clearly specify that in the intended use that, that SharePoint 2013 will be used for the management of electronic records, um, both document and documents and data, uh, within the context of regulated pharmaceutical environments. Um, and we, we then further outline what the, the, the records are considered to be, so documents that are required to be maintained by predicate rule, data um, that's required to be maintained by predicate rule, or or audit trials that we're generating for electronic records. So this really then gives us a clear scope um, for us to be able to move forward within our, our, our validation um, uh, process. The next part of the validation assessment is really to ascertain um, whether the system has regulatory impact or not. And so we have a series of different questions that we ask, and we do this for all systems that we validate. And this comes really from a uh, an article that was published um, in the DIA journal um, a few years ago and we felt that it was very pertinent um, to be able to ascertain whether um, the system needs to be validated or not. And so we can see um, for SharePoint, question number seven comes out as yes. So does the system create, modify, maintain, archive, retrieve or transmit records that must be available for inspection by a regulatory agency? And so the answer to that is yes. And if we answer yes to any of these questions, then basically the system needs to be validated. So this provides us with rationale that we can present to an inspector or to an auditor 
to show why we feel that, that we need to, to validate the system and within which context. The next part of the validation assessment is really to, to look at 21 CFR Part 11, and we do the same for Annex 11, um, and look at what the requirement is. And so we can see in this, in this uh, example, um, we're talking about um, 1110C, so protection of records to enable their accurate and ready retrieval throughout the records retention period. And what we do is we actually um, describe within the assessment how we feel um, that SharePoint 2013 meets this requirement. And we talk about both technical controls and procedural controls. And so we explain the, the, the features and functions within SharePoint which would allow us to meet this requirement. Uh, we also um, cross-reference uh, any SOPs that we have in place, um, which, which correspond, of course, to the procedural controls and that, is, that allow us to meet the, uh, the requirement. We may also um, reference um, our, our user requirement specification document, um, which we can see here in the right-hand column. Um, and within that document, uh, we also specify um, typically the actual individual requirements um, that we've defined to be able to meet this, 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 uh, this requirement of 21 CFR Part 11. So we go through each of the different um, parts of Part 11 and Annex 11 and identify all of these things. And this really gives us our, our context and it's a very useful document to present to an inspector or an auditor so that he can understand or she can understand exactly how you've interpreted Part 11 and how um, you've implemented the controls. The next document, once we've completed our validation assessment, is really the validation plan. And the validation plan governs the validation process for a system. And so typically within your organization, you'll, you'll have an SOP on validation, but you also would prov produce a plan for the specific validation um, exercise that you're going to perform. The validation plan outlines really the validation scope and our risk rationale. So whether we're applying a risk-based approach or not, um, and, and how we're, we're performing that risk assessment. It also outlines the validation approach itself and the prerequisite requirements for validation, so any dependencies on other systems or documentation. We also list out all of the documentation deliverables for the system, and then finally we outline the roles and responsibilities. The plan typically needs to be high level. It also needs to be flexible whilst providing clear directives and clearly specifying what's required to achieve compliance. If we're deploying SharePoint within a controlled and non-controlled configuration, so typically for regulated and non-regulated um, applications or solutions, then the plan really needs to state that we're only actually validating the controlled part of that deployment. So if we look at some examples again from our, our validation pack, so the first thing that we do here is, is that um, we define the validation scope. Um, and uh, here um, we're, we're, we're basically um, cross-referencing uh, any change request number or validation master plan for the project if we have a validation master plan. We also talk clearly about um, the validation assessment. Um, and the different areas that we feel are subject to validation based on that assessment that, were, that was done. Finally, we also speak about what is considered to be out of scope. Um, and this is very important because really we're only trying to qualify the baseline as any applications or solutions deployed on top of SharePoint would have their own validation documentation uh, their, and their own validation scope. So here we're, we're basically saying that the following elements are excluded from the scope of this validation effort and that's any customizations that address specific business needs that are not related to 21 CFR Part 11 subpart B electronic records. We also say any integrated third-party applications or solutions and electronic signatures are also out of scope because they would have their own documentation set. We then talk about um, the validation approach um, and so we indicate that we would be using a, a risk-based uh, approach, that this is a Category 4 system um, and uh, we're also referencing the SOP that we're using to manage um, our, our validation process. We'll also cross-reference um, the, uh, the validation assessment um, so that there's a link back to that document um, if the, uh, the auditor or inspector is actually reading um, this plan.
finally we list out, uh, well actually not finally, the next uh, step is to, to list out the document deliverables and so we have the different deliverables that we're producing within the context of SharePoint and so we have these, these different documents which are the documents that are required um, by GAMP uh, 5. Um, and then finally, we also list out uh, any other documents, notably all of the SOPs that we would be required to have um, to be able to use this system for regulated activities. The last part is the roles and responsibilities. And so here we'll actually uh, define um, the different roles. So we have four primary roles, and, and this is really aligned to uh, GAMP, but also Annex 11 in Europe. So we have the validation team. And then we have the concept of system owner and process owner, um, and then finally QA. After that, we uh, identify all of the different documents, and we identify the role uh, of each of those um, different players in terms of what they need to do. You know, are they reading documents? Are they approving documents? Are they producing documents? Um, and so this way, it's very clear who's doing what uh, within the validation effort. Once we've got our, our assessment and our plan, um, the next thing that we're doing is really putting together a, a requirement specification. So a requirement specification is a document that defines all of the, the business or, or end user requirements, functional requirements, any performance uh, requirements, regulatory requirements, um, and then finally uh, system architecture and security requirements. What's, what's very, very important with requirements is that they have to be precise and they have to be measurable because if they're not measurable, um, it's very difficult for us to test against them. Um, they need to be precise so that we can actually uh, better contain our testing um, and, uh, and avoid having sort of very, very long uh, test scripts. Typically, uh, we use requirements to develop our test scripts, um, and within the context of the validation pack that we provide for SharePoint, we're really only limiting those requirements to 21 CFR Part 11 electronic records, so subpart B. Um, other requirement specifications would be produced for other SharePoint applications that we deploy on top of the baseline platform. So this is how um, requirements look within our documentation. So we have the, the reference to 21 CFR Part 11. So here we can see the requirements for audit trial, so 1110E. And then afterwards we have unique um, measurable requirements on the right-hand side um, which have been defined um, to be able to clearly outline um, how we need to implement um, the regulatory uh, requirement on the left. These are very standard and typically don't need to be changed um, because obviously we're really only looking to meet 21 CFR Part 11. The next um, document that we need to produce um, is our functional and configuration specification. And so the functional specification really allows us to describe how the system functions meet the user requirements that we've defined. The functional configuration specification really describes how SharePoint functions will meet those requirements. And so we've produced these documents and, and we've mapped them to uh, our, our, our requirement specification. We also describe how we need to configure SharePoint to be able to meet those requirements because out of the box, SharePoint wouldn't be compliant with 21 CFR Part 11. We have, we have to actually configure it and do certain things to it um, in terms of configuration to make sure that we're, for example, generating audit trails, that we have proper security etc etc um, any uh, any other applications um, such as infopath forms workflows any custom web parts features or solutions or any third party applications um, would require additional functional specifications and configuration specifications so this is um, a, an extract uh, where we see clearly uh, on the the left hand side all of the requirements and so we're we're, we're referencing those requirements using the unique identifiers. And then afterwards, uh, on the right-hand side, we're explaining the functionality within SharePoint, which allows us to meet um, those requirements. And so you can see we're, we're, we're sort of building traceability as we go along. This is um, another example of, of part of our, our functional and configuration specification, where we actually um, clearly describe all of the various different steps that we have to go through to be able to properly configure um, SharePoint uh, to be able to meet uh, the requirements of 21 CFR Part 11. In terms of our configuration specification, this is um, obviously a, a very important document because um, 
SharePoint, as we mentioned earlier, is a, is a very granular system and there are many, many different um, configuration parameters that typically we need to use. And so here at Montreal, we've developed a configuration template uh, that we use, um, which allows us to uh, manage all of our site and library settings, our libraries, uh, content types, columns, all of our security groups and user rights, and then any template and workflow deployment. This specification has to be versioned. Uh, it's really a controlled document and forms part of the uh, system documentation. It's also auditable. Um, and every time we, we make a change to the specification, typically we need to go through a change control process. So this is fairly uh, difficult to see, and it's really only a very small uh, extract um, from the configuration specification. But basically, in this example, we're, we're listing out all of the different um, document types that we're going to be managing within SharePoint um, on the left-hand side. And then we can see that we have all of the different metadata components that we're um, going to be applying to each of the different content types uh, going along the top. Um, and so this is just one example of how we can actually document um, the application of metadata to document types within SharePoint. There are many, many other configuration parameters as well that we need to define. And so it's very important to have a very strong um, document to be able to do this. The next document we need to produce is, is a trace matrix. The trace matrix um, is really a, a living document um, that's maintained throughout the life, uh, the lifetime of the system. Um, it's a very, very useful document to be able to navigate uh, within all of the, the documentation that we've produced for a system. Um, and it basically links uh, all of our test scripts to the user and functional requirements. It's also a document which allows us to uh, clearly demonstrate that all of uh, the requirements have been adequately tested. Um, we can also link this document into the uh, risk assessment as well. This document is a living document and therefore it needs to be versioned and it needs to be updated um, during uh, change control. And we need to be able to go back in time to see uh, previous versions of the trace matrix. Again, an example from our validation pack, and this, this really shows the, the connection between the user requirements, the different uh, specifications and on how SharePoint meets the requirement, and then finally a, a reference to the test script uh, or the procedure that we're using to be able to properly verify that we have the controls in place. Um, we can add other columns to this, of course, um, to demonstrate whether um, the test scripts that were executed were successful um, and, and as I said earlier we can also link in to the uh, risk assessment um, to indicate the level of risk of particular requirements or specifications. So once we've got all of that documentation in place the next thing that we have to do is we need to do configuration testing or IQ. Um, and the primary objective of IQ um, or IV in GAMP5 um, is to ensure that all software modules are installed correctly. Um, typically, uh, the IQ will list um, the process for installing um, different modules, and so there's a step-by-step -step process um, which explains to the person who's doing the installation how they need to do the installation. This list also um, defines the expected results at each control point, so typically we'll have control points. Um, the IQ also ensures that all of the documentation uh, is in place for the system and that the system is adequately protected um, in terms of power and backup and things like that. It also um, ensures the proper verification of the structural uh, elements um, to all of the sites and the content types, etc. It's recommended that um, you, you develop an IQ protocol which really explains exactly how the IQ needs to be executed. Um, and that we develop IQ scripts um, for the installation of the baseline SharePoint and any other third-party applications that you're also going to be deploying at the same time within the validated environment. So this is an example of, of uh, our standard IQ that we provide as part of our, our qualification or validation pack. Um, so we can see that, first of all, we, rec we record all of the uh, parameters, so all of the machine parameters. We then provide step-by-step um, -step, um, installation instructions um, to be able to deploy um, the SharePoint environment. And we also uh, require that we log um, the various different parameters as we create them. 
Once we've, we've performed the installation, so the inst installation qualification, we then move into what we call um, OQ or the functional testing. And functional testing really consists of end-to-end -end positive and negative testing, um, which uh, allows us to verify that all system components are operating as intended. And this is both hardware and software. And the tests uh, are executed um, on the base functionality, so they're really sort of functional tests. Um, typically, they're, they're executed by end users in IT. It could be it could be just IT, but that's really up to you as an organisation. We have a test protocol which governs how testing is performed um, and, and documented. Tests are typically broken down um, into test scripts by functional area. We want to have a certain amount of granularity in case we need to re-execute in the future. Um, and each of those tests are linked to a baseline system function. These tests must be approved before execution and then all results have to be clearly documented using good documentation practices, um, also known as, as ALCOA. So attributable, legible, contemporaneous, original and accurate. Tests really serve uh, as a mechanism to verify that the system is operating correctly in its installed environment. So this is an example of, uh, of uh, an, an OQ test script that we provide for um, testing um, SharePoint to make sure it meets the requirements of 21 CFR Part 11. So the first thing that we have to do is we need to define all of the prere prerequisites and any values that we're going to be using for that testing. We then have the different uh, test steps, so this is typically followed by the, uh, the person executing the test. Um, so they'll go through each of the different steps, they'll look at the expected results and they'll verify that that's what they have. Um, at the end of, uh, of uh, the sequence of steps that they've gone through, they'll record the actual result, um, especially if it's different, and then of course they'll indicate whether they feel the, uh, the, the step passed or failed. Um, they'll also initial and date so that we can make it attributable. These, of course, could also be uh, executed electronically. Once we've got through all of that, we've, 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 um, we've really verified um, that SharePoint um, has been configured properly to meet the requirements of 21 CFR Part 11 electronic records. Now, uh, within the context of, of SharePoint uh, baseline, we, we don't actually typically execute a PQ because there is no real customization. Um, for the uh, the organization it's very very standard if there was customization then typically you would produce something like this PQ really consists of positive testing of, of company specific configuration and user requirements and these tests um, really uh, are focused on business specific functionality such as workflows or, or info path forms or any other um, SharePoint or, or third party solution that you're deploying on top um, the tests are governed uh, by a test protocol, again, uh, which clearly describes how we execute the tests and what we do um, in terms of deviations. Uh, the tests are broken down, uh, not functionally, but by business process, and we link them back as well to user requirements. Again, they have to be properly documented using Alcoa, um, and these tests are usually executed by the end users because they're really... Um, being executed as a user acceptance mechanism to be able to clearly demonstrate that the, the system meets its intended use. Um, but as I said before, just for baseline SharePoint, we don't need to do PQ, but as soon as you start deploying applications on top of that baseline, you will need to do PQ. Once we've got through all of our testing, um, we need to write up a, a validation summary report. The summary report really describes how um, the validation effort went, it verifies that we've closed all of the deviations um, and it allows us to be able to approve um, all of the, um, the CSV documentation that's been executed uh, and put the system into production. You can produce individual summary reports for each of the testing steps or you can have a comprehensive report at the end. We, we typically prefer a comprehensive report at the end for uh, applications like this. It makes it a lot easier to, to get, really get a big picture of everything that happened. Um, the main goal of the report as well is really to show that the validation plan and any protocols were, were, were followed and that the acceptance criteria for putting the system into production have actually been met. Once we've got a system in production, of course, we have to have then proper configuration control uh, to be able to maintain the validated state. 
and usually we'll have a, a specific procedure or governance plan um, for, for SharePoint, um, because obviously there, there's a, a specific context that we need to, uh, to address. Um, this, this procedure can, of course, um, cross-reference as well um, a, a more general IT configuration control SOP, which quite often organizations will have if they're running regulated applications. The procedure should govern the update of the, uh, of the configuration specification, um, so the, the whole process for, for updating and then applying those, those changes. Um, it should also um, be used to clearly document any updates or additions to the SharePoint environment with, with third-party applications or solutions. Any changes to the validated controlled environment must also be documented using change control. So typically we'll have a change control form and a change control SOP that we use to do that. Should significant changes or additions be made, we may need to actually uh, launch a whole new validation project uh, where we have a, a validation assessment and a plan uh, and then all of the other uh, various different documents that we need to produce. If we're really making minor changes, typically we can reference existing uh, functionality and test scripts within the change control form. Uh, for workflows, forms, or any other features or solutions, it's imperative to really uh, correctly evaluate uh, the impact and risk um, of any changes that we're making, uh, or, or even if we're introducing new features, uh, and, and produce the adequate test scripts to properly integrate uh, and test um, those additional elements in the, in the current uh, validated environment. So hopefully that gave you a good idea about um, the approach that we can take to validate SharePoint um, and the different documents that we need to produce uh, to be able to clearly demonstrate that this system uh, is fit for use. Now, obviously when we're validating, it's very important that we maximize quality and, and also that we get um, return on investment. And we know that validation can be very expensive and consuming if it's not done correctly. By defining a, a very clear validation strategy and then also, of course, leveraging risk assessment techniques, we can really focus on what's important. What are the high-risk areas of the system? And maybe for non-regulated or very low-risk areas, especially if we're dealing with um, uh, an off-the-shelf product, um, we can potentially you know, significantly minimize the validation effort or even not test at all. You can, of course, consider acquiring uh, tried and tested uh, test scripts or validation packages for SharePoint or third-party uh, tools um, to, to reduce the amount of time that you need to take to produce those documents. And of course, those documents typically have already been uh, executed by many different organizations and so usually don't present any, any uh, real problems. Um, and as I mentioned, Montreum does have such a package uh, available. You need to make sure that all of the individuals involved in the effort really uh, really understand what, they're, what they're, they're trying to do in terms of computer systems validation. They need to be trained um, both generally on, on the CSV process but also on the specific validation effort that we are about to execute on. We need to uh, isolate uh, controlled environments to facilitate validation and configuration control. This is really in relation to SharePoint. Um, obviously, we can use it for regulated and non-regulated activities, and so we have to make sure that we have a proper architecture model which allows us to, to separate out those two, um, two environments whilst also having, obviously, one farm and a, and a holistic environment. And so there are ways and means of doing that, and we just need to sort of work that out uh, in an architecture model and then ensure any controlled areas fall under configuration and change management control. Uh, another um, way of, of deploying SharePoint which really sort of facilitates the, the deployment is, is using virtualization or virtual machines. Um, so that we can facilitate, obviously, the, uh, the replication of those environments. It's also very useful for disaster recovery purposes as well. So to finish up, some lessons learned and, and best practices. So Montreal has been uh, deploying and validating um, SharePoint environments and solutions for, for many years now. I think we first started in 2006. And so over the, over the years, we've gained a, a lot of experience in, in how to go about this for GXP environments. And one of the first things that we really do when we sit down with a, with a client is we create a, a big picture 
of exactly how that organization is going to be using SharePoint um, so that we can properly identify both the controlled and non-controlled uh, needs uh, and, and really build out uh, a very strong architecture which is going to be scalable. We, um, we use a, a risk-based approach and so it's important to use a risk-based approach and it's now prescribed obviously by Annex 11 uh, to focus uh, uh, and reduce validation efforts um, but of course when you're doing that risk assessment you need to be strict uh, otherwise everything becomes high risk. Remember that SharePoint is an off-the-shelf product um, and therefore we need to, to really limit the validation scope to high-risk business and regulatory requirements as much as possible because obviously Microsoft has already done a lot of testing on all of the different features and functions of SharePoint. You need to establish a, a SharePoint validation team to oversee and manage the validation process uh, and the changes to that SharePoint environment. Typically that same team could also be responsible for governance and, and obviously you need to put in place a, a governance plan as well. You need to implement uh, SOPs and work instructions which clearly define how the environment is configured uh, and administered and to which level of documentation revalidation uh, is required uh, by the, the type of change that we're making. And then finally, as, as you sort of move into to the deployment of SharePoint for regulated applications, it's very important to identify a step-by-step -step process um, so that you can deploy um, you know, applications fairly quickly um, whilst keeping things manageable. So to, 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 to finish up, um, I think the main question here is, is really um, with validation. It's very, very easy to drown in, in the details uh, of, uh, of the, the, the validation documentation. And so it's very important to take a very pragmatic uh, approach and, and try and keep it simple. So with that, that concludes our, our webinar for today. I, I hope it was very informative for you all. Um, I am available for any, any other questions you may have. Feel free to send me an email or, or Twitter me. Um, we will be running some more webinars uh, in the uh, autumn or the fall for, for our North American colleagues um, and uh, we will be sending out information on those webinars. Notably we'll be talking um, in September about um, the use of uh, Microsoft Azure, so the Microsoft Cloud for regulated applications and, and some of the work that we've done to be able to um, properly qualify that. So with that I thank you all for your participation. Um, and I very much look forward to your feedback. Um, once the webinar ends, there will be a few questions that come up on your screen. If you would be able to answer those questions, we would really very much appreciate it. It allows us to, to improve our, our webinar content and also better understand your needs. So thank you, everybody, and, and have a uh, nice weekend.